Great, thank you very much. I'm Darren Bibby of IDC. I feel like I'm kind of amongst friends here. I know a lot of you in the, uh, the audience. Um, I follow Renee on uh, Twitter. Renee, I am Cloud, very good. Um, Annette Miller and I are on um, LinkedIn together, friends there. Actually, I'm good friends with uh, Daniel Cheng from AMA. We're on Facebook together. And uh, just this morning, I, um, I met Ben Gower on Tinder, so that was a strange story. This cloud thing, is it evolution or revolution? Put up your hand if you think the cloud and what it's doing for your business and customers is evolution. How many think it's revolution? How many think it's a bit of both? How many people hate putting up your hands? We'll, we'll never know. We'll never know. The, the reason I bring this up, and I think it's a, it's a worthwhile conversation, is that if you just think that cloud and the whole third platform of, of social mobile analytics cloud, if you think it's just evolution, it's just going to happen you know, bit by bit with your customers and your company, you might miss something and, and be behind. I think there's a lot of very revolutionary things going on. Today in my talk, I want to talk about seven major transformations that I think solution providers out there, VARs, MSPs, uh, small ISVs, uh, system integrators, all have to go through these seven transformations. And uh, some are going to be quite revolutionary. I thought Robert Stevens' talk was great, and one of the things he said is borrow ideas from other industries. So I want to do a little uh, story at the beginning about um, the photography industry, the imaging industry. In 1995, there was about $1.9 billion of profit in the photography or imaging industry. And it was made up of things that, if you go back in time, we remember photo finishing at retail. Do you remember you actually used to have a, a photo, right? Remember that? Those days you printed them out. And film manufacturing, right? Fast forward just 10 years. There was $3.7 billion of profit in 2005. And, you know, the, the major thing then was memory, okay? And if I just do a little build on this, 11% of the profits in 2005 were categories that existed 10 years before. 89% of the profit in 2005 in that industry were from brand new categories. Is that revolution or evolution? Very interesting to think about. Well, who was the big player for all that time? You know, Kodak was a market leader for over 100 years. I mean, 100 years. Talk about sustainable competitive advantage. In 1976, they had 90% market share in film and 85% market share in cameras. Unbelievable. They were immortalized with the term a Kodak moment. And in 1975, they developed the first digital camera in the industry. It was eight pounds, but they were first to do it. <laughs> so what could possibly go wrong with this story, right? So the digital camera division and the digital camera was really quashed by the very powerful film division, right? Because they were making a lot of money. The executives loved it. They were just very happy with themselves and very happy with the fact that they made tons of high gross profits from, from film. Didn't want to think about any other reality. But by 2003, Fujifilm, major competitor, had 5,000 digital processing labs in the USA, and at the same time, Kodak had less than 100. Right? We all kind of know bits of this story. I, just, I thought this story was interesting. What did Kodak do? Backs are against the wall. What's their, what's their strategic response? Well, a few things. First, they're really good at film, so let's just discount film and, and sell as much of that as we can. OK, it's kind of a, a back against the wall strategy. Well, let's catch up in digital cameras. Actually, by the early 2000s, Kodak was number two in the US for digital cameras, but they were losing $60 every time they sold the camera. That's not sustainable. They thought that, uh, hey, we kind of know chemicals, right? Film is, is a lot of chemicals. And we really like high profit margins, so let's get into the pharmaceutical business. That's strange. That didn't work out. They lasted about six years. They thought they could create inkjet photo printers. And this is the same kind of razor and razor blades, camera and film, right? We all know that analogy type of business. We're going to make these uh, photo printers, and then we're going to have uh, lots of repeat recurring business with the, uh, the ink. They got killed by HP in that market. And their final response, let's sue everyone. <laughs> you know, talk about a back against the wall strategy. We're going to sue everyone. We're going to do patent trolling. And they did. They made a, a bunch of money on that. But again, not exactly a, a competitive, a sustainable strategy. And in the end, you know, bankruptcy protection. 
I just like looking at the photography industry. I love photography myself. You know, what happened kind of after Kodak failed in the last uh, bunch of years? Well, we had these small digital still cameras. So, you know, the Nikon Cool Picks, the, uh, the Canon Elfs, right? And that market really took off when digital photography came out. And you can remember, I remember my first digital camera I bought in 2002, 2001. It was a two megapixel camera and it, had, it was $700. And just a few years later, I bought a seven megapixel camera for $200, right? The cycle compression that we're talking about in this industry and, and in our industry, the IT industry, is unbelievable. So, you know, by 2008, actually by 2010, we had uh, almost 70% of US households owned a digital still camera. What happened around, and, and this, <laughs> you never want to go last at these conferences because everyone said all the good ideas. What happened in 2007 in our industry? The iPhone. So digital still cameras actually started to tank, and smartphones, because you've got uh, cameras on them, uh, started to take off. And you just take a look at that last year in our forecast here, digital still cameras, the ones that leapt off the page and came right back down. Uh, you know, about 20% of households have a digital still camera, while you know, over 70% have a smartphone. Unbelievable. You know, w um, Robert talked about look outside of um, you know, conventional thinking, look outside your industry for ideas. Uh, can anyone shout out who the number one manufacturing of camera number one manufacturer of cameras is today? It's actually Nokia. If you think about emerging markets and they've got you know unit volumes, they're doing unbelievably well in emerging markets, unit volumes, and they have the most cameras. So you know things again you wouldn't necessarily think of. So digital camera growth, I mean, you know, minus 40% US uh, for the digital stills, minus 30. The interchangeable lens cameras not doing great. How about digital camcorders? Really interesting area. Well, traditional camcorders are tanking, right? Minus 23%, minus 51% worldwide year-over-year -year growth. But point-of-view cameras, oh, OK, very interesting. What's a point-of-view camera? <laughs> There's better ones. It's come a long way since this model. You can put these GoPros anywhere. You can strap them to your chest, go skiing on your helmet. You can put them on the end of a pole. You can put them on an animal. Um, unbelievable what these guys have done, and they are absolutely killing it in the marketplace, growing uh, huge amounts, and they've got huge share in this idea. But, but what's next, right? What's even next, right? Cameras on drones. Probably not going to see a lot of drones being sold without a camera. It's just like buying one of those remote control helicopters, fun for the first few times, and then, you know, but you put a camera on it, gets very interesting. And may I predict, as an analyst, that 2014 was the last year you felt comfortable getting an all-over tan in your backyard, <laughs> right? <laughs> Not anymore. The photos you can get with these uh, drone cameras are unbelievable now. I, just, I love this one, very simple one. Someone's just flown it up in the air and taken a photo down. How about this one? You could, you could not, from any other means, get this picture of uh, being that close to a bird and still keeping the background in focus. Unbelievable photo. And can anybody tell me where this photo was taken? An unbelievable um, perspective. Hard to hear up here. The one hint is it's very north and there's no trees. If someone said Iceland, good for you. I was going to say they also have unpronounceable volcano names. And then the Familia uh, Sagrada in Barcelona. An unbelievable shot. Maybe you could have got this if you, you know, hired a helicopter, but very, very cool that you can do this. There's a, a book out right now that it might be worth looking at, The End of Competitive Advantage, and it basically has summarized it. There's no such thing as sustainable competitive advantage anymore. There's only transient competitive advantage. I think that, you know, we look at the cycle compression of, you know, film cameras were around for, you know, 100 years or so, and then we talked about digital still cameras. You know, we're going to still have those, but now it's, it's in your iPhone or your phone. I mean, the cycle compression in that industry, you know, and, and of course have a look at our industry, the tech industry. Think about that in your own business, right? Don't think that you're on something and you're going to be on there forever. Transient competitive advantage is the only thing that's real now. So back to our industry, the IT industry, I want to talk about the seven transformations that, that you in this audience, IT solution providers, must confront. And there's seven. There could be more. Actually, Robert LeBlanc had one that I, I probably want to add. I, I always thought about adding. Uh, the, and it's all about partnering. You know, in the old world, maybe you could do everything or as much as you could on your own. But in the new world, you're going to have to do a lot more partnering to bring a whole solution. So that'll be my eighth one next time I do this. But let's start with the technology. Of course, the technology has really, really changed 
At IDC, we call it the third platform. The first platform was mainframe computing, terminals, right? And that lasted for many, many years. And then there was a fundamental shift as we went to PCs and client server computing and LAN internet. And then a few years ago, we, we knew something was happening in the industry. And a few years later, we said, we're going to call this thing the third platform. And it's really known by social, mobile, analytics, big data and analytics and cloud. Uh, you're seeing all sorts of acronyms for it. The, the one here at the conference are using SMAC, right? It's got a lot of impact, SMAC, these new technologies, social, mobile, analytics, cloud. Um, another one, just to remember, it's MASK. Uh, IBM, I know, likes CAMs, very easy to remember. The one you never see, and I don't know why it's never uh, uh, coming up, but um, social cloud analytics mobile. No one talks about it that way. So, <laughs> But if there's one slide, if, if we want to talk about a Kodak moment, you want to take a picture of one slide, if we have a look at the second platform and first platform spending and then versus third platform, this is an unbelievable story. Here's what's going on. The second platform is clearly the biggest uh, platform. In 2013, if I go back a couple years at the beginning of this, um, third platform was about 26% of our industry already. So what's that, 74% is the second platform and before. So lots of business still in that second platform and lots of companies in this uh, audience still you know, really enjoying that. But by 2020, we're looking at 44% of the industry being third platform technologies, social cloud, analytics, mobile. Oh, shoot, I wasn't supposed to do it that way. And, only, um, and, and the rest being second platform. The problem, though, is, and, and you could see it with those numbers, is just the growth rates. You know, we feel that, that later in 2015, the second platform will go into recession. We'll start going into negative ground, right? So if you want to compete, and not be in the third platform, if you just want to stay in that second platform, you essentially have to take share off of someone else if you're going to grow anything beyond flat, right? You're going to have to take it off your neighbor, well, provided your neighbor's not your, you know, coworker. But you're going to have to take that uh, off someone else. Or what you probably have to do is really play in that third platform of technologies, and cloud, of course, being a huge one. Let's focus a little bit on, on cloud. We're definitely seeing a shift from on-premise to cloud software. Um, some of these stats, I, I feel quite honored that uh, many of the other presenters up here, including Renee, used a lot of IDC material. Um, just, just to state it, I don't think I heard that other uh, analyst company mentioned at all in the last couple of days, so I thought that was pretty cool. Um, we're looking at $127 billion of public IT cloud services revenue by 2018. And by the way, a lot of stats get thrown out. I want to be the one who tries to explain these a little bit further. What do I mean by public IT cloud services? Well, this is kind of the transformative part of cloud. This is public cloud. It's SaaS, platform as a service, and infrastructure as a service, not including private cloud and, and all sorts of other services around that. If you do add all that stuff, that's looking like 200 billion by 2018, the greater cloud market. The spending, therefore, is about 5.5 um, times IT spending overall at 23%. And uh, a key stat that was mentioned earlier in the conference is that for the first time ever in our surveys, and this was a survey of 3,500 um, businesses around the world, over 50% of firms have adopted some kind of cloud at this point. So it's evolved, it's revolved, if that's a word. But we're also going, this, this one's revolutionary to me. We're going from selling servers to selling services. IDC predicts that service providers will account for over 43% of total server shipments by 2017, right? This idea that we're, we're not selling servers to a, a mid-market company and they put it in the back closet or in their own data center, it's gonna go to a service provider and they're gonna provision a service. And, and this one blows me away. By late next year, we feel that 50% of raw compute capacity and 70% uh, and of storage capacity will be installed in hyperscale data centers. And, and when I say hyperscale data centers, I'm talking about 25, 25, 25 companies around the world who have massive uh, data centers. We're talking about uh, SoftLayer, Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, um, Google Cloud Platform, Facebook, and then a bunch of pharmaceuticals and banks and other massive companies. That, that's revolution. I mean, that's unbelievable that it's happening this quickly. Some more, a little bit more about the landscape. Renee also mentioned this one. 70% of CIOs will embrace a cloud-first strategy by 2016. Well, what do we mean by that? 
it doesn't mean cloud in the end, necessarily. It means um, companies are going to look at the cloud, uh, public cloud option first. And if that satisfies their needs, that's a great model for them. But if there's something about where the, the data is, if there's something about the, the complexity of their situation, they need to customize it more, maybe they'll go to some kind of private cloud or some kind of hosted, uh, uh, hosted environment, or perhaps even on-premise if they really think they can do it better themselves. But the idea is that they're going to look cloud first. So I would suggest to you in this audience that if you don't have a cloud first type mentality when you go to talk to these CIOs and other lines of business um, buyers, you know, if they're thinking cloud first and you're offering cloud last, you, might, you could be in trouble. By 2018, we're predicting that nearly 27% of all software revenue will be subscription based. And actually, if we add the huge amount of uh, money made with maintenance from big companies, that's 60% of the software industry is basically recurring revenue in the next few years. So the technology and the buying patterns and all that is, is changing a ton. The next thing I want to talk about is a shift that we all have to make in this room from IT, focus on IT as your customer and what you do for a living, to business, but not forget about IT. We feel that by uh, late next year, line of business executives will be directly involved with 80% of new IT investments. And we actually think that the line of business buyer will be the decision maker in about half of those. So you've got to ask yourself, am I speaking to the right people at my customers, or am I still stuck talking to the IT department? Hey, there's still business there, absolutely. But you know, where's the growth? It's with those line of business buyers. So how do you guys as solution providers you know, learn the speak of those people? How do you start to talk in retail terms? How do you talk about, um, you know, can I help you solve um, your problem of you know, getting more sales per square feet? Can I, can I talk to an insurance company about lowering the average cost per claim? When you can talk in that industry's speak, in their jargon, in their words, using their metrics, that's when the magic happens. And you can start to raise fees if you really understand an industry. Um, not enough solution providers that I meet are, are doing enough of this yet, and we're seeing that this is definitely where it's going. Let me tell you kind of my little two-by-two two matrix um, of the CIO and the CMO then and now. So the old CMO, and they probably didn't have a chief in their title, it was probably like a VP marketing, uh, director marketing, something like that. We call this the, the black turtleneck marketer, the black turtleneck CMO. This person probably came from an agency, maybe one of the, the mad men type people. They really understood Pantone matching system colors, right? They could tell that that shirt didn't go with that suit. Sorry about that. Um, but they could tell these things, print ads. They were good at radio. They were good at television, things like that. They didn't know a lot about big data. They didn't know a lot about social and things like that. They didn't have to. And then there's our old friend, the CIO, or as many like to refer to him as the CI know. <laughs> They ran an operating uh, cost center, a cost center basically. Their goal was, you know, 80 to 90 percent, keep the lights on, you know, keep, uh, keep things going. And, you know, maybe there's a little bit of budget, a little bit of time uh, available for innovation, but really, really not much. They had a fiefdom. They were paid to, again, keep things running, keep things efficient. Today's CMO really is in that chief executive or that chief suite, the C-suite. They have to understand big data. They have to understand analytics. They've got a, a socially aware web audience, right? I mean, you, you think about anything you buy these days as a consumer and, and, again, as a business. You're doing a ton of work yourself online. You're going to all the sources, getting educated. At the, you know, by the time you end up getting to a salesperson, your mind's kind of made up. I, you look at buying a car these days. I mean, does anybody really go into a car dealership and say, you know, educate me about your cars. You've probably done the math. You're probably going in to maybe do a test drive, maybe see if consumer reports is right. You're probably going in to see what the price could be, but you've done a lot of that work. So this is what the new CMO has to deal with. You know, one, one, uh, one guy who gets his guitar smashed by an airline and they, you know, write a, a song about it, you're kind of in trouble if that kind of thing happens, right? So being aware of that kind of stuff. So very different for the CMO today. And the CIO, much more of a team player, much more uh, gold. Uh, their metrics are much more on business performance overall and not just their little fiefdom, their operating center. So this is an, an, a good trend. Uh, it makes their job really, really difficult. They've got, a, they've got a lot to think about, but at least they're more of a team player. I say that we can't forget about IT, though. Um, 
one uh, soft, big software company CTO, ch chief technology officer I met, took the CIO job at that company. And he just told me the story that I, I thought I was going to be great in this role. I thought it was fantastic. You know, I'm the one to, uh, to do some innovation in our company and to, to get things going. And I was all gung-ho until we had our first outage. <laughs> Then that IT side of things really, really meant a lot again. So, you know, we can't, it, it's not a complete shift. When I first did these slides, I said, you know, I like to be black and white about things, from IT to business. Not quite the case, but certainly that's where a lot of the growth is, is on the business side. See, we're, we're also going from a lot of IT complexity in our world to much simpler things, business outcomes. Um, many people in this room, I can kind of see the age of a bunch of you through the lights, but you know, you've enjoyed a great industry for the most part over the last 10, uh, 20 to 30 years. There's been a lot of IT complexity to figure out and a lot of customers didn't quite know how to figure it out. Well, things are getting simpler and simpler. I mean, you, you know, you don't really, if you, if you need a CRM application going now, you don't have to install servers, install the network, install the database, get security going and then put on the CRM application. You just go to salesforce.com, log in, and within an hour, you're doing something. I'm not saying it's the right thing, but you're doing something, right? So things have changed a ton. So you know, if, if that was a lot of your revenue before, figuring out IT complexity, and, and you're seeing where things are going, what can you replace that revenue with? That's a question a lot of solution providers I meet are, are thinking of. Well, they're thinking more around business outcomes. They're thinking more around how can I how can I help you to use this CRM software or use this uh, solution and get the most out of it? So they're thinking about things like training and adoption, usage, right? Getting them using the software. They're thinking about things like change management. If I install some kind of uh, social um, software for you, you can't just put that in and expect everyone to, to start using it. Uh, Robert Stevens talked about, um, I'm going to get it wrong, was it Stack? Uh, something like that. The, um, the, the, the workforce one, someone else said it. Um, but the, the key is maybe you're going to go in now and be more of a business process consultant on that social implementation. You're going to say to the, to the C-suite, you guys really have to be the leaders in this. Maybe you're going to go and figure out that, hey, if you don't have some kind of activity stream from sales or, or marketing or Twitter, something in that stream, no one's going to use it. You know, it's these types of um, you know, process consulting things that, that might become a, a bigger deal in the future. And, you know, if you think a few years out, if you can solve business problems and produce business outcomes, you can kind of name your own price. The quickest way to get back to $65 an hour is to go back to the VP of IT and say, you know, how can I, how can I give you some bodies to help with your IT stuff? A huge one, and this is really one of the biggest reasons a lot of companies are not going to cloud, is that we have moved from the deal or the transaction to the relationship. And this is really about cloud, managed services, anything that comes from a recurring revenue type of model. In the old world, everything we did um, was about getting to that point of transaction and running away. I saw someone tweet, I didn't see all of Robert LeBlanc's session, he said it, it used to be sell and run, right? Fire and forget, sell and run. And now it's gotta be about land and expand. Well, I'd also argue it really has to be about usage. Because if you get these guys on these long-term you know, hopefully long-term relationships, it's only profitable if it's long-term. So it's all about the use. And if, if I back up for a second, in the old world, you know, everything was about getting that transaction. The salespeople we hired, that mentality of go get it and go get the next deal, the incentives we gave them, the training we gave them, everything was about getting to that point of transaction. And now it's all about, you know, getting them to use it because there's actually no money. It's actually zero dollars at the point of transaction if you think about it, there's no revenue unless you do some kind of services piece and you bill some up front. But the Federal Accounting Standards Board doesn't allow you to recognize revenue until you've delivered the service. So here we go from this massive upfront deal, sell the hardware, sell the software. Um, the FASB, that group said, yeah, you could recognize that as revenue, but you can't recognize the service as revenue until you deliver it. Man, this is gonna be hard for a lot of companies. This is gonna cause a lot of unnatural behaviors in salespeople. Right, if I'm a salesperson, I can sell the old thing and get all the money up front or this new thing and it's you know, kind of pennies compared to this. So this is causing a lot of companies to figure out how do I organize, how do I pay my people? So there's a lot about that. Um, one of the key things that's happening is companies are coming up with this idea of customers for life organizations. I remember that here in the term yesterday. Or, cust or having customer success managers. Right, this idea that if I don't get these guys to renew on and on and on, then, you know, 
I, I, it, it cost me too much to, to get that business. So very big changes coming through the, the sales motion. Um, I know there's other sales training at this event. I, I really think you have to rethink selling in this uh, new cloud world. And of course, your time horizon, just because of recurring revenue, really has to move from short term to long term. I mean, ours is an industry where people are just fixated on 90-day segments, uh, quarter by quarter, right? And you could make up your quarter in the last uh, days, minutes of, of a quarter, right? I mean, we can't go to that anymore. It will be about recurring revenue. On the top chart here, this is a typical project-based business, right? You're, you're cyclical, you get some deals, you have a slow month or two, you get some more deals. Um, maybe over time, you're growing 10% at a time. But every project you got this year, you got to go earn again next year, right? Unless it's contractual. And a recurring revenue business, you know, day one, year one is really tough. You get a few, uh, you get a few people on board, you start getting those, those fees in. And again, I, I could be talking about reselling a cloud uh, piece. I could, you could be getting a fee for a, a cloud piece of software. You could be doing managed services still on that monthly basis. Um, or you could be doing other recurring revenue uh, pieces. But Year one's tough. Year five, if you plan this out, if you think about it, it's very easy for me to say I get that. But you got customers, hopefully most of them still from year one, customers from year two, customers from year three, year four, year five. It's a beautiful business model over time. And you know this because you pay these fees to your cable company, to your telephone company, to your insurance company, right? This model is, is famous and very, very profitable, but it takes time to get to. Um, I wanted to tell one story before I get to this slide. If you can go back one slide, or if not, it's not a big deal. Um, I, think someone, I think Robert was talking about haircuts. I, I love this concept of haircuts as a service. I heard about this a few years ago. I thought, that's interesting. It's never really been coined. I'm not uh, proposing. I think it'd be worse to coin a stupid phrase than not be coined at all. Haircuts as a service. So barber shops, salons are figuring, instead of this one-time transaction that I'm always kind of getting someone in and getting a haircut for $20 whenever they remember, um, they're selling basically a subscription. You keep coming back to my barber shop and pay me a, a monthly subscription, you know, I don't know what that cost would be, but I'm not only going to give you a haircut whenever you come in, however often you want. Um, you can have a shoe shine, you can have a glass of wine, and that's part of that experience, part of that um, that service. And so the idea is taking something that's very much a one-time transaction, can you make that into something that's more uh, recurring? So IT solution providers that I've met are doing some kind of cool things. They're looking at um, IT department as a service, CIO as a service, right? Can I be CIO depart the, the, the IT department for small uh, companies, right? Can I take support hours and basically say, I'm going to sell you, you know, discounted support hours and I'll bill you every month for it. And if you use them, great. If you don't, you paid for them, right? Um, and so these are the types of innovative things I'm hearing uh, solution providers doing on this idea of recurring revenue. And cloud can actually be more profitable, you know, given time. It may not be uh, as much revenue uh, because of some of the things we've been talking about, like streaming it over time. Um, but you can get uh, quite good profit. You get this whole idea of, you know, I, I sell this service for $100 uh, a month, and I, you know, costed out it was $60 a month. Over time, you can bring that $60 down. There's, uh, solution providers have told me uh, a million different ways. They, they automate. They get repeat deals. They take most of their um, architects and technical people inside to do remote delivery, right? They can come up with their own methodologies and their own automation. Um, there's, there's just a ton you can do to start moving that $60 down. I just use that as an example. So, By the way, I don't need a, I don't need a camera shot of, of the gentleman in row two anymore. I know you're focused on him. <laughs> I don't need that. <laughs> that. That joke happened a long time ago. OK. CanCom is a large German VAR, about 600 million in euros in revenue. They uh, were not happy with their financial performance. I'm actually going to put up a little chart here from um, our, our financial analyst brethren, the ones that make a lot more money. <clears throat> Um, they, they looked at uh, this company, CanCom, and looked at their um, EBITDA, okay? actual net profit and earnings. The red bars that you can see is actual dollars profit, and the gray line is really what I want you to look at. Because before 2010, 
this gray line, well, it represents the um, EBITDA margin. So basically that net net profit that, um, that this company would, would figure out or would, would, uh, would get in the end. I mean, they had 1.6%, 2.3, 2.6, 2.3, 2.7. It really wasn't a fantastic business. You know, you're at least looking for somewhere around 5% uh, EBITDA uh, from a VAR business. They, they decided, we're going to the cloud, we're going to manage services, we're doing some of that idea of offering these things, automating, bringing people in-house, remote delivery center, all that. And they really started to take off over time. 4.0, 4 4.6, 5.0%, 5.6, estimated the end of last year was going to be 7.1% EBITDA. A pretty nice um, return on that strategy, I think. So I thought that was interesting. We've, we actually found a VAR totally public that we could look at some numbers. I thought that was very cool. The poster child, though, for moving to a recurring revenue business has to be Adobe. Um, you know, Adobe moved a few years ago, right around uh, April 2012, I think. This gentleman from Forbes said, the stock market values companies with more regular cash flow more highly. Even if the revenues were the same, the costs the same, the profits were the same, moving from a variable revenue stream such as upgrades, right, you never know when a, a client's going to upgrade, to a more regular one such as subscriptions should boost the value of the company itself. And they still really are the poster child for this move. And I can only imagine the, the offsite that these guys must have had to say, are we going to go to cloud? It's not really cloud if you think about it. You're not doing Photoshop in the cloud yet, but they call it creative cloud. It's recurring. It's subscription. They're not doing software licenses anymore. Um, I can imagine that offsite, the senior VP of sales would have been over my dead body. I love our model. It's, it's like a drug. Software licenses are like a drug, right? Um, but the visionaries, as I talked to some Adobe people, the visionaries won out, and they have uh, done very, very well. In fact, one of the first uh, quarters they released their new results after this new strategy, they had lower revenue, lower profit, lower everything, because they made this, this shift, and their stock went flying up, because Wall Street expected it to be even worse. They've been rewarded. Their stock's more than doubled since they've uh, announced this. It's, it, you know, it was really not doing very well until, until this happened. So very interesting stories, I, I find. For partners in this room, I, I was very pleased to hear Renee talking about this. Recurring revenue and, of course, cloud, managed services, all that kind of stuff is a big part of this. Um, it can absolutely help your valuation. How many in here either own your solution provider company or have some kind of stock in your company? OK, so really, really pay attention plus the other 50 people who hate putting their hand up for any reason. You know, we're seeing that, um, I mean, the quote here is good. For the average sub-5 million a year VAR, it's tough to get past three times EBITDA. And we're actually finding from many, many conversations that you know, small solution provider companies, 10, 50, 100 people, actually their, their idea of what they're worth is way inflated, very, very inflated. And so we kind of did some reality checks with venture capitalists, with other partners who buy partners, with other VARs who buy other VARs. And we did some of this math, and um, the EBITDA multiple might be two to two and a half times, but maybe it could be up to five to 14 times for more of a, a recurring revenue cloud type company. There's a lot that goes into valuation. Um, obviously, recurring is a big part of it, but being on the latest technologies like the CAMs. SMAC technologies, um, having some kind of product that you produce or methodology, some kind of re something repeatable. You got to ask yourself, am I buying another company? What am I really buying? The people, they could walk away. Uh, your customer list, unless it's contractual, they could walk away. So I think this is a really interesting uh, concept and topic. And I think that this could be one of the key motivators to actually get a lot of companies to make that you know, maybe revolutionary change and shift into, into cloud, even if the early days aren't going to be as, uh, as good as they used to be. Marketing. This is a huge one. Marketing has to take on such a bigger role these days. And the marketing has to move from traditional to digital. This one could almost go for a lot of um, typical solution providers from what's marketing to you got to do marketing. Like that could be the shift we're really looking at. A lot of solution providers didn't grow up uh, understanding the marketing. A survey we did years ago said that two thirds of solution providers started up from technical roots and they had to learn the business. And about one third started from business roots and they had to learn kind of the technology side. But even if you think about that one third that came from business, they probably came from sales or operations or something. It wasn't marketing. So it, it's tough. I understand that. And there's a lot of great resources from Microsoft and IBM and Ingram and, and others to, uh, to help you. 
but we're seeing some of the best solution providers put a lot more emphasis into their marketing. With the new cloud economics of you know, recurring revenue streaming it over time, you probably can't afford anymore to have your you know, several hundred thousand dollar a year sales guy chasing these little deals. You have to have a lot of deals coming in. You have to, if those um, buyers are gonna get educated on the cloud, you know, they wanna buy the cloud in the cloud, well, why not have all that education on your site? There's some great tools out there from the vendors around um, web content syndication. Put that stuff on your site. Um, some of the best partners are creating videos, how-to documents, FAQs. Um, a lot of them are really uh, leaning on a topic and becoming an expert in it, whether it's technical or whether it's some in, with some kind of domain, like, again, retail, insurance, manufacturing, et cetera. Uh, they're, they're doing videos on this stuff. The one video I was actually going to show you guys, I, I chose not to out of simplicity, but th there's a couple uh, partners who just for $3,000 um, $3,000 actual hard costs, they made videos on YouTube that are in excess of 100,000 views. That's a pretty good cost per impression. You know, they just, they have a little bit of creativity in one or two employees, they create these things. But, um, you know, as uh, Robert Stevens said before me, you know, get creative. There's, there's got to be a lot of good ideas you got, uh, can do with this marketing, but it's, it's got to be digital. Um, I heard the other day that talking about digital marketing will soon sound as silly as talking about color TV, right? It's going to be digital, so you have to get there. And then the set of activities that you're actually doing with it in your business. If I ask you, you know, what are the activities, how you make money? I think that we're moving kind of up in, in, a, in the, the stack here. We're moving from you know, being uh, reliant on your resale business to moving to services. Doesn't mean resale's not important. That gets you a lot of deals and you want to be in control of the account but we're seeing you know, good partners, we're seeing all partners move more and more of their business to services and adding some kind of services or, or non-resale business. In 2005, the number we think uh, from our, our stats as we go back, it looked like the, the typical US VAR had about 53% of their revenue coming from resale. And by 2014, it was about 35% of their business was coming from resale. Did I say retail a minute ago? Resale. Right? This idea that more and more services are coming up because there's more margin in services. So don't forget about the resale, but you've got to move up in the value chain. And then wherever you can, start moving those you know, variable, get them when they come in, professional services jobs to more repeatable managed services and you can build up more and more of that business. So we're seeing that, tr that trend. And again, there could be you know, really good pr um, profit percentages you make that move. And then finally, we're seeing a lot more companies, especially because of the cloud, moving from just doing custom services to um, building IP, right? Building applications or building reusable components or at least building methodologies, maybe some automation in their own um, operations. I mean, in the old days, it was an art to be an ISV. You had to be on top of the latest uh, release of Windows, SQL Server, Oracle Database, DB2, whatever. And, and you had to be right there with the dot one or dot one patch, right? It was very difficult. And then, of course, getting your, getting your ISV application found was very difficult. Uh, I mean, what were the best ideas we had back in the day? Uh, AOL CDs being shipped in your magazines? I mean, you know, today we've got marketplaces. And there, there's just you know, so many amazing places where you can put your, your intellectual property, put your applications if you've got it. And with the cloud, you don't have this idea of you know, your, your application breaking because the underlying technology broke. It's a service now. It's very different. Um, and of course, you can get started with platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, much, much different than in the old days. So we're seeing that change too. And all the while, you're kind of moving up the stack and moving to higher gross margin for each of these activities. So I think if you ask yourself, uh, you know, if you're just doing resale, you know, what's your business going to look like in two or five years? Even the largest uh, DMRs and resellers, I remember interviewing them in 2008, and they said, we're not going to compete with the VARs. We don't do services. Have them bring us some business, perhaps. Let, we'll let you do the services. Well, they have all really increased their services arm. So it, it's certainly a, a trend. Um, I want to end on uh, competition. And I think it's interesting that um, Robert Stevens also talked about looking at other industries for ideas. But you also got to look at other non-traditional players as your new competition. I give you a bunch of examples. I mean, somewhat traditional but non-traditional is the born in the cloud partner in the middle. Um, 
from one of our surveys, these guys are actually coming out of firms like yours. About one in five companies who are looking at uh, you know, what they're going to do about their cloud strategy, they're, they're actually you know, sectioning off a business because there's so many conflicts within cloud versus your traditional business. So there's all these born in the cloud partners out there. And um, I, think, I think maybe Renee said this on, on the first day too, but it's really not hard to start a, a business anymore, right? I mean, you, you, know, you could just get your uh, email by the month. You could get your compute storage, whatever, by the month. Um, so you're OK as one of these small businesses born in the cloud partners bringing in your income by the month versus a lot of traditional solution providers are kind of figuring out, do we do this cloud thing or not? While you're having that conversation of do we do cloud or not, or how do we figure out our salespeople, these born in the cloud partners are going and, and winning all these deals off you. They love it that you're confused with, with you know, what to do. So really look out for these guys. I've definitely seen large solution providers say, I'm sick and tired of these born in the cloud guys uh, taking my deals. I've got to start a cloud division, or I've got to do something, or a separate P&L, or another company, or whatever it is. But that's a, one, um, one person in the industry I know, he always talks to partners about how many uh, deals have you lost to born in the cloud partners. And you can kind of do that analysis to say, you know, of the deals we lost, how many were to those guys? And then quickly, because I'm running out of time, you know, your customers are coming up with their own technology solutions and then selling them to others. Right? There's a law firm I met, and they figured out the best way to do messaging security for their law firm. And they said, hey, we really figured this out. We could offer this to other uh, law firms. There's a bank that I, I, I got to hear about, and they came up with the, based on platform as a service, they came up with the cloud application that basically runs their bank. It's a small community bank. They sold this to 50 plus banks already. They you know, sectioned off that company once they figured it out. So these are, these are kind of new competitors out there to you guys. Um, what about the bottom left? Tra travel agencies have become a channel for concur expense management. By the way, accountants have long been a channel for accounting software, right? So you get this idea that your competition may come from very unnatural and non-traditional non sources. And then what about the hobbyist or citizen developers? Here's Mark Zuckerberg in his uh, earlier days. The craziest ideas out there, the ones that are really going to revolutionize industries, are coming from what I call hobbyist or citizen developers. Not the well-paid professional developers. They kind of iterate bit by bit and make, make things a little bit better. It's these guys coming from nowhere that are going to uh, come up with the, the big new applications. Um, IDC actually predicts that in the next few years, one third of every industry's leaders will somehow be disrupted or transformed or disrupted and taking out, taken out of their leadership position because of um, third platform technologies, right? You're going to have companies like Uber come along and completely, completely revolutionize an industry. And we're going to see other examples like that again and again. So that's the seven. I might add some more. Hopefully that was a good almost summary of what you've heard in some of the other sessions about selling the line of business, about um, recurring revenue, et cetera. The thing I've got to say, though, is none of this concept makes any sense without the right culture. Peter Drucker said that culture eats strategy for breakfast. If you don't have the right culture, if you don't have the right leadership, if these ideas aren't um, you know, supported, these transformations in your company, they'll go nowhere. So think about that and what culture you come up with. So we can continue this evolution revolution thought, but there's a lot of these transformations that you guys will have to think about in the years ahead. I'll remind you of this great um, quote, this idea, there's no, no such thing as sustainable competitive advantage anymore, only transient competitive advantage. And one of my favorite quotes of all time, I heard it off a business partner from IBM just last fall, if you don't like the feeling of change, you're going to like the feeling of irrelevance even less. <laughs> Thank you very much.